Cafe in the Boston Park Plaza Hotel. This is the Smoky Bacon and Dick Concannon Show with co-host Joanna DiTillo. So stay tuned. Our guest today is Carolyn Emke, uh, who has written a book uh, which takes us into some of the terrible war-torn areas of the world. Uh, tell us, how did you get that title? How did I get the title? The yes. Echoes of Violence. Um, well, for one, uh, because I'm uh, a music uh, fanatic. Ah. I, I love classical music uh, right. and I really adore uh, classical music. So uh, to have a title that would resonate somewhere musically, that was uh, one idea. Uh, the other is that the book um, deals with uh, all kinds of violence. Uh, and it actually not only deals with physical violence, but also with the trauma that um, you know people who are victims of violence uh, have to go through and live with for many, many years. So uh, echoes of violence also means that there are traces that violence leaves in the victims, uh, and they somehow you know continue to. Uh, Know, sometimes destroy the lives, uh, destroy the language, uh, destroy the subjectivity of those who are victims of war. Well, one of the elements in your book that uh, uh, came home to me, we all know about the wartime elements where everyone is shooting and, and, and we get it daily on our television, but you had two areas, Romania and Colombia, which both uh, uh, affected me in the sense that they weren't uh, shooting war areas, but rather tragic areas in themselves. I mean, Nicaragua. C Nicaragua. Col Colombia okay. is... Not uh, Colombia, is I'm sorry. Uh, yes, that, those were the uh, two areas that uh, uh, caught me, the Central America and Romania, especially the young children and so forth. Uh, tell us, how did you pick that out from your uh, German uh, eagle's nest? Um, I, chose, I chose to include Romania and uh, Nicaragua in a book that's otherwise just on wars um, because what I'm interested in also when I write about wars is actually structural violence. What I care about is the way in which um, people who are excluded from a global we, uh, people who are excluded from their communities, who are victims of structural, physical or psychological violence, um, how they are completely negated as human beings. And that takes place and happens in sort of real classical traditional war zones as it happens in areas, you know, that experience a different kind of repression or injustice as in Romania which is a country where you um, have one of the most devastating uh, experiences of uh, trafficking of children um, so that's why why I included it into the book it's a different sort of violence it's not a war zone but it's as Depressing, depressing, and upsetting as any other area that I wrote about. The area uh, that was seen most brutal to me uh, was old Yugoslavia and all that uh, that has become part of. Uh, I don't know that it's over yet. It's quieter uh, and. Tell us, does that have any parallels with our situation today in Iraq? No, 
I don't think so, because if you look at if you look at the, the, the countries of the former Yugoslavia, if you look at the Bosnian war, if you look at the Kosovo war, if you look at uh, you know the, the, the ethnic cleansing, you could clearly see how it was um, you know a result of uh, you know a political regime that had an interest in sort of first nationalizing a particular conflict and then producing really. Uh, you know the ethnic violence that then basically destroyed the entire uh, country. Um, I think that's not comparable to Iraq because here we have uh, clearly, you know, we had a, you know, a dictator uh, governing uh, Iraq, but uh, but didn't we you have know, a Tito too? Yeah, but you know, you cannot compare Tito, uh, you know, to Saddam Hussein, and also you would say it's it's Milosevic. Who, who brought about yes. you know, the violence in that conflict. Uh, and clearly we have you know, an external actor in Iraq, uh, namely the United States, so we yes. cannot ignore that completely. <laughs> no. uh, you know, they, they do have some influence uh, uh, on the current situation. Right. Well, tell us uh, your life uh, just goes from one turmoil to another. Tell us, what do you have in, in mind for the future? Um, I have in mind for the future to continue traveling to areas of conflict. I have to say, even though it might sound uh, very, you know, depressing or dangerous or uh, maybe strange to uh, outsiders, why would one do this and why one would travel to, you know, areas of conflict. At the same time, I have to say, I've, uh, I love traveling to these areas. I've encountered uh, the most dignified uh, human beings in areas where they you know are denied their dignity I've encountered uh, the most impressive generosity in very impoverished areas of the world so it's a joy also let me say in in the element of encountering uh, you have run in uh, to my wife's niece Joanne Marin, and when we saw that in the book, that uh, got us very excited. Yes, uh, Joanne, I met Joanne Marino, who was working for Human Rights Watch uh, in Albania actually for the first time, and I traveled with her for a couple of months. She's the most amazing human rights researcher I've ever met. Very, very impressive woman uh, with enormous grace under pressure. All right. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show, and let me tell our audience here that this is a, a book of, uh, well, I guess it could be called adventure, but it is much more serious, and you'll really enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much. In 2004, the atrocities that were happening in Darfur were not being covered. They were not, and there were many people that knew about this. And one was our guest today, Jen Marlow, who's written a book, the Darfur, the Darfur Diaries, Stories of Survival. And they, she decided, with a couple of other friends, to go there and do a film with the Darfurians giving their own story in their own words, not an NBC reporter, but they would give their own stories. But the thing is. Jen, you had to change the names of people because they took a great chance talking to you, didn't they? Well, you tell our viewers. Sure. One of the reasons we traveled the places we did, we were in the refugee camps in Chad and we were in rebel held areas in Darfur, is because we very much wanted to make sure that people stayed protected. If we had spoken to people in areas controlled by the Sudanese government, even if we'd been able to get a government visa, that would have come with a government translator. Uh, and people would have paid a price for talking to us. So we did protect people's identities by we didn't put their last names, we didn't always uh, specifically identify where they were, um, but we were very careful to talk to people who were out of reach from the government. Now, the man who had the key role uh, in the film, Hotel Rwanda, has said that he felt the solutions were in Deforians and, and Africans talking to the, you know, the Arabic citizens, that, that, that for them to converse back and forth. Is this possible, do you think? 
I think it is. Uh, I mean, pa Paul Rousseau Begina, who, as yeah. you said, you know, he was the his was the character that yeah. the movie Hotel Rwanda was based on, and he's been to Chad. He wrote the preface for our book, and. Um, Look, Darfur traditionally and historically was a multi-ethnic, multi-fabric society. It will take a lot for Darfurians to stitch that fabric of that society back together. Um, but there is a very strong historical basis for this. What's happening in Darfur is not a civil war between the tribes at its core, the way the media has, has tried to There's portray it. There's a great it. distortion it's, there. You mentioned absolutely, this in Absolutely. It's, it's very much a campaign of the central government of Sudan against its own civilians for its political agenda. Uh, the people in Darfur, I think, can stitch their fabric of society back together. It'll take a lot of support, but I think uh, Paul is exactly right that they that it is ultimately in their hands. But you also mentioned, I mean, in stitching things back, I think about, you mentioned there are 100,000 children that are involved in the armies in Africa. What do you do with these children that have been trained to kill mm -hmm. at the age of 11 or 12? Well, I, I was that was talking about child soldiers in general. Yeah. There's a, the statistics show that there's 100,000 child soldiers in the world. One third of those in Africa, oh, um, okay. not and, you know, so not necessarily okay. a great okay. concentration okay. in Darfur. But yes, it is. It is an issue, and I think one of the greatest fears that I have when I'm looking at the future is the fact that. Although this did not begin from ethnic hatreds and from that that's not the core of what's happening, I think the children who have been so traumatized, yes, they, they have a, they, their history isn't the one of multi-tribal harmony. Their history is one of this brutality. And so a great deal of emphasis will need to be placed on them being able to heal from their trauma. But before we can even talk about that, we have to, the, the trauma itself has to stop, and the violence is ongoing even as we speak here. I know. Now, do I have this, the, the statistics right on this, that two million people have been displaced? Over two million people. And, and 200,000 are dead. The, the number of how many have been killed is very fluid. It's very hard to, those, those tallies and those numbers are very hard to come by because there's huge areas that the international community hasn't had any access to in terms of tallying the statistics. So you can read it anywhere between 200 and 400,000 in different reports. Um, but regardless of which statistic you go with, it's, it's an overwhelming tragedy. I have to explain to our viewers here that when Jen Marlowe went into this area, she was not going in as one of the persons people say in the book that in fact she had been in dangerous situations before, so she was not going in bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. She had the experience. Explain how you happened to, you know, go into film and how you got together with your two friends, if you would tell our viewers. Sure. Well, I had been working the past four years before that in Palestine and in Israel, and I had begun to use video uh, as video dialogue projects with Israeli and with Palestinian youth going across borders where the young people wanted to communicate with each other, but they couldn't meet. So, but I could take the video camera. I could go to Gaza then bring those messages to youth in Tel Aviv, then bring those messages to youth in Janine. And so I was beginning to wrap my brain around the power of film and video to communicate very difficult messages. At the same time, my colleagues Adam and Aisha were beginning to develop a plan to go and film in Darfur because it wasn't being covered at that time by the mainstream media at all. And they wanted to take matters in their own hands and do something about it. When I had lunch with Adam and he told me about these plans, I had never heard of Darfur until that, that moment. I don't think any of us had right. until well, you and a number of people started to publish it. Absolutely. And, and one of the reasons why that was so disturbing to me is that when I had lunch with Adam, it was May 2004. That was exactly during the 10-year anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda. Rwanda was being talked about a lot during that 10-year anniversary. You could see dignitaries from the UN making speeches at many different memorial services, basically pledging that the world had learned lessons from Rwanda and would confront a similar situation and to you, differently. No lessons have been learned. Right. We have to go, Jen. Our guest today has been Jen Marlowe. Filmmaker extraordinaire, author also, Defour Diaries, Stories of Survival. I have to explain that much of the proceeds from the film, because it's a very expensive thing to do a film, as you soon found out. It is I'm true, sure, yes. Uh, are going back to the people you, you uh, explained, some are going to. Yeah, I'd love to. A portion of the proceeds from the film and from the book are going to uh, fund schools and support schools in the destroyed villages where we filmed and in other areas of Darfur, because the Darfurans themselves told us of the vital importance of education to themselves and their children. They, and, and so, and under threat of death, what have you, these in your book,
book, you explain how these people were just intent upon getting their children to the schools. Absolutely. So it felt like a very natural fit of that we could support their efforts to educate their children. A lot of information about that and the whole project is on our website, which is darfordiaries.org. Very good. It's been a delight having you here. Thank you good so luck. much for having me on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our guest today is Nicholas Sullivan, who has written a book, You Can Hear Me Now. And this is an unusual story uh, about an individual, primarily, although there are many people involved, that went ahead and took on a situation in Bangladesh, was to introduce telephones to a country that virtually uh, had only a few elite persons that had phones. Uh, tell us, uh, how did this all get started? Well, this gets started. I met uh, Iqbal Qadir as the person in question, who's a Bangladeshi American, uh, was living in Boston when I met him. And um, so he told me his story, and then I went back and researched it about uh, leaving his job in New York in 1993 with his inspiration to return to Bangladesh to uh, start a cell phone company. Uh, he had had a breakdown of his computer system in Manhattan, his office, and he realized that without uh, connectivity there was no productivity. And then he realized in his native Bangladesh there had never been phones. And uh, in fact, now many of the places in rural Bangladesh, 80% still has no electricity. So he went back to Bangladesh persuaded uh, Muhammad Yunus, the founder of Grameen Bank and the Nobel Peace Prize winner, that this was an idea worth backing. And the way he did that is uh, he initially tried to get Yunus and Grameen Bank to be the no first customer for this phone company. Mm -hmm. And Yunus said, I have no interest in that. But if you can show me a way to make phones affordable for poor villagers, then I'll back you. And so Eunice at that time was lending small amounts of money to villagers to buy cows and to women who, to buy cows who would sell the milk to pay back the loan. And Iqbal Qadir said, why can't a cow be a cell phone? Why can't you lend money to villagers to buy cell phones and they can lease the time and pay back the loan and so forth? And that's, uh, that was the kind of new paradigm that broke the logjam. That, that was the, the most interesting part is the effect that the phone had, uh, not just socially uh, in communications, but economically, it, uh, it made a tremendous difference to a great number of very, uh, well, we, how low was their budget? The rural <laughs> poor. Well, I mean, you know, a, a dollar a day is what, uh, yeah. is what it was really. And, and still now the per capita income in Bangladesh is $440 a year. So it's still very low. But the cell phone has uh, unleashed a torrent of economic activity. Um, there was one phone for every 500 people 10 years ago. There's now one phone for every seven people. The, r the number of phones are doubling every year. And it's being used as a not only a productivity tool for farmers to sell their crops and so forth, but also um, it's just creating a whole uh, chain of indigenous entrepreneurs who are selling uh, SIM cards and cell phones and solar panels and cables. And uh, it, it's now responsible for two to three percent of the uh, GDP of Bangladesh. And the country itself is growing at a rate of six or seven percent, which is up from three to four percent. So it's, um, and it's also being used as a, as a mini computer. I mean, people used to think that the digital divide was lack of internet and PCs. In fact, it's in poor countries, it's often just a lack of phone communications. You know, the one element uh, that is part of this story that is beyond the economic is it's almost heroic, uh, the work that this uh, man suffered through, went through his own personal fortune, just traveling, running all over Europe in, a, in an attempt to get the funding 
for this uh, project, and this is a, a human story. Well, it's a Ellen. human story, and what attracted me to it initially was just, it's a great business story. It's a story about a relentless entrepreneur who um, did spend four years. Uh, he had a $125,000 angel investment from a wealthy New York uh, investor, uh, Josh Mailman. And, um, so he went for four years on that. He gave up his life as an investment banker and um, ran around looking for a foreign investor. When he first started in the United States, someone said to him, we're not the Red Cross. Why would we go into Bangladesh? But finally, he persuaded Telenor of Norway to come in. And um, the, it was pretty uh, uh, visionary of the CEO of uh, Telenor at that time to go into Bangladesh, which was considered a basket case by you know all that, uh, benchmarks. Again, he tackled one of the most difficult countries to uh, add anything economical to, but that started an explosion uh, all through Africa. Right, right now, there are more cell phones sold every day in Africa than in North America. Every day, week, month, and so forth. And um, it started a little bit later in um, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, um, but it grew just as quickly. And now, every year, from the year 2000 on, basically, the cell phones crossed the landlines, and now it's just an explosive uh, doubling every year. Uh, you know with the new paradigms of shared phones, prepaid cards, um, and so forth that have allowed people who, um, you know, living on very, very little to actually use the technology because whatever it costs, it's obviously worth it because it's product productive for them and it, it, it leads to other opportunities, other businesses, other connections, and so forth. Well, let me say this book by Nicholas Sullivan is one that uh, once you, you start reading it, you're carried on and on to see the final resolution to this story. And it, it never totally resolves because they're moving on now to other uh, challenges. Uh, it's a great well, story. Well, thank you very much, and I encourage people to look at the uh, website, youcanhearmenow.com, where you can read excerpts from the book. And Thanks so for I being think, on the I show. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Right. Our guest today is Mr. Dick Flavin, who is a well-known raconteur and a master of ceremonies here for in Boston, but he also travels throughout the entire country doing his works. Dick, let's stay close to home. We we lost the Patriots, but things aren't so bad. Things aren't so bad. Uh, I, I think the Patriots got as most out of that team as as they could. I think when they beat San Diego, the better team lost, and when they lost to the Colts the better team won. So I, I think they got the absolute most out of uh, What I can say game. for both of those games, for anyone who is not totally locked into one of either side, they were the most entertaining football games you could go to. Great theater. Oh, Great theater. The and that's amusement what, uh, element ab was absolutely, extraordinary. Absolutely. And, and uh, after the Colts uh, uh, loss, which was uh, difficult to to take, I managed to get through it because I don't have the passion for the Patriots, although I root for them, mm. you know, but I do for the uh, for the Red Sox. When the Red Sox lose a game like that, I'm weeks getting over it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go. Let's go to the Red Sox. Uh, our Bruins and Celtics. I am afraid I'm not going to get us into any playoffs. So let's. Let's talk about what are the Red Sox going to do this year. Well, I'm a, I think I'm typical of Red Sox fans in that I hope for the best and expect the worst. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've been through so many disappointments over the years with uh, 2004 being, of course, the uh, uh, exception to the rule that uh, we, get, uh, we get used to living with the pain of... Uh, of rooting for the Red Sox. Well, you know, the, the Red Sox, uh, I do a lot of little poets and poetry and doggerel, and the Red Sox have named me the Poet Laureate 
of the Boston Red Sox. So they asked me a while back, there was a dinner a while back, and they said, could you do something in honor of Larry Lucchino? So I thought for a while, and I came up with the musical tribute. Uh, you don't mind if I subject no, you? No, no, go right ahead. <clears throat> I wandered today to the park, Larry, my gosh, the place looks great. And on it you have left your mark, Larry. The changes have all turned out first rate. The green monster seats in left field, Larry. The EMC club behind home plate. They not only have a great field, Larry, they all mean more money at the gate. You've sold a few ads in the place, Larry, and they bring in more bread. If you're looking for more ad space, Larry, just sell the top of Francona's head. Your eyes on the old bottom line, Larry, and for that John Henry sends his thanks. Oh, gee, everything would be fine, Larry, if we could just beat the bleepin' Yanks. You've sent all the dough to Japan, Larry. Will you send many to whatever it is that you plan, Larry? The town will be second guessing you. The media is all on your back, Larry. Sox Nation is out for blood, I fear. But you can throw them off the track, Larry. Just tell them to wait until next year. Very good. I don't Very know. good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well. Thank you very much for being on the Thank show. You, we'll, Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Dick. Great that, to see you. That song will hang in for a long while. 30, 40 seconds. <laughs> From the Swans Cafe in the Boston Park Plaza Hotel, this has been the Smokey Bacon and Dick Concannon Show with co-host Joanna DiTillo. Join us next week, same time, same station.